Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for joining Heritage Talks Online. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm here with Glenn Patterson, and we are project directors for the Quebec Anglophone Her Heritage Network, otherwise known as Quan. Quan is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and promote the history, heritage, and culture of Quebec, and in particular of Quebec's English speaking communities spread right across the province. If you go to our website at qahn.org, you'll discover the activities and projects that we're involved in. And you can also see our projects on the Quan Facebook pages, including the schedule of talks for the Heritage Talks Online. Our winter spring series actually only has one more speaker after tonight, but you can still go to the Facebook page and see her topic, the time of broadcast, and you can click to join on the Zoom as well. Uh, it's a public site, so you don't have to have your own Facebook page to do that. If you've missed any of our broadcasts, you can go to the Facebook page and see the past recordings. We've recorded everything, so everything is right there for you. You're welcome to become a member of Quan, and membership is open to everyone, including community groups and organizations. So please check our, in our website for more information on how to become a member. Membership gives you access to interesting workshops and programs and projects and to our quarterly magazine called Quebec Heritage News. It's a really fantastic news magazine filled with wonderful stories and images about history, heritage, places, and people that you will not meet in history textbooks. So if you want to find out more about Quebec's past, this is the magazine to get. Um, I encourage you to become a member and receive your own copy and to take advantage of the 30% membership discount that we have going on right now during the time of the broadcast itself. It's for one year, $20 membership, and if you'd like to claim the discount, you can simply send us a message on Facebook Live, or if you're on Zoom tonight, you can put a message in the chat box to say you'd like to take advantage of the 30% membership discount and become a part of our great community right across Quebec. I would like to thank our funders who helped make this event possible, including Canadian Heritage, the Secretariat for Relations with English-Speaking Quebecers, the Chalkers Foundation, the Zeller Family Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. Thank you very much. Our guest speaker tonight is Suzanne Morin. Suzanne is the Executive Director of the Bruck Museum in Cowansville. She previously held the positions of Creative Director at the Canadian Geographic Enterprises in Ottawa, and in New York City as the Art Director of Audubon, the magazine of the National Audubon Society and a senior designer for Pentagram, an international design firm. She was also a design consultant for the American Museum of Natural History, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and Canada Post. Her talk this evening is called Textile Stories, The Bruck Mills and Its Legacy. Hello, Suzanne, and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. for introducing me and for inviting me to uh, this Heritage Talk series. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to um, tell you stories about uh, an upcoming exhibitions we are planning for next year in view of the uh, 100th anniversary of the uh, Brock Mills, uh, which opened its door on um, officially on uh, July 21st, 1922. Um, I'd like to give you a little background about how this uh, project came about because this presentation is based on a uh, virtual exhibition um, we are working on uh, with the Digital Museums Canada. Um, we're also planning a gallery exhibition next year in, in the museum here in a in a room that will be dedicated to that. And it will probably be a permanent exhibition about the history of the Brock Mills and also the history of the building here, which is a lovely uh, um, historical home um, built in 1874. So, and which was originally a bank, the Eastern Township, the, one of the first Eastern Township um, branch. So um, in terms of uh, giving you a little background, um, 
uh, I want to also clarify that this is work in progress. I'm sort of, uh, this is kind of a teaser or preview. I'm not sure what to call it. Um, and uh, it's a project that is in the works, but there's, uh, um, but we're moving along. And I, it, this is a great opportunity for me to get uh, feedback and, and uh, possibly um, input also from uh, some of you. Um, so that we can um, not only fact check things properly, but uh, have it be uh, most interesting to, um, to, uh, to people. We're also trying to reach both French and English communities with this project because it has, um, as you um, know, um, history that uh, is also, I mean, it's your, it's your story and, and our story as well, because as you, uh, you may have seen in the introduction um, with the logo and everything, you may recognize that first yard of silk that was woven in Canada uh, in, uh, at the Brock Mills in 1922. Um, it's, um, um, just a second here, I'm, 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 I'm reading some notes, I'm getting a little uh, off. Um, so, um, Yes, you you are already familiar, I'm sure, with um, the. Um, can you see this? You you see it well. I don't have it in my PowerPoint, but it's that very uh, your very own collection. In actually, uh, includes that uh, first yard of silk. It's in our lobby here. Um, and uh, when I first started working here, I um, was very uh, surprised to uh, find out about this yard of silk because I'm actually, um, I grew up in Cohensville. And even though I knew um, of the Brock Mills and, and uh, all of the few, several generations of workers and had um, uh, in the area here, you know, lived there and half the, the classrooms in this schools I've been here, uh, people knew or had uncles and aunts or grandparents or parents who had worked there. So anyway, um, when I found out about this yard of silk, I realized that uh, um, that story was uh, very interesting and I didn't know any about anything about it. And I figured if, um, if I don't know anything about it and I'm from here, um, I bet a lot of people uh, would, would be very intrigued with uh, what's what, what this is all about and about the history of the Brock Mills, um, who had a very, uh, was very important to the development of this town. Um, in fact, at some point it was nearly a company town. So, um, so um, the inspiration actually for, the, yeah, this whole project um, came from discovering this yard of soot, but also um, I I found that um, the museum at the time uh, was kind of a new museum in the sense that it had just become a non for profit organization and uh, when I was hired here it was because it was no longer a um, a, um, um, a department from the town of the, the cultural service of the town so. Um, it didn't have a visual identity or, or a kind of a brand. And I, I thought this was an interesting, um, an interesting, uh, in fact, it's the French word that I'm having a really hard time translating a filon in French. In fact, the project is called filon textile because a filon is like a vein of gold or a, a mother load or um, I guess those are the translations I've seen for it. But in any way, I thought it was um, incredibly interesting that that this heritage background could be used to to uh, differentiate our museum maybe from other regional museum. And also, I thought we might we have an art collection here. We are also a museum of art and heritage. And I thought it would be interesting to develop a. Um, like a niche for textile, contemporary textile arts as well, so that we could have both the history, the historical um, exhibitions and uh, an art exhibition, but not necessarily totally uh, entirely focused on textile, but that could be um, like a niche, like I said. So, um, so I moved forward and kind of pitched that to the, the board, the, the new board and of the new museum with the new director was me. And um, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, I guess, I, I convinced 
everybody that this would be a good direction to bring uh, the museum uh, in. And uh, I wonder if I should start the, the, um, the PowerPoint now. Do you want me to? Do you want to play that video still, uh, Suzanne? Yeah, maybe that would be a good a good time just to okay. give people a, a sense of. Uh, sure, okay. I'll do that. Uh, just a comment. Um, the your microphone's picking up your paper moving a lot, so just just try oh. to keep your keep your paper oh. shuffling to a minimum if you can. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries. You couldn't know. Only <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll start this video in a second. Just bear with me, everyone. encore la laine et le coton suivant le principe du vieux rouet. Mais la rayonne est le résultat d'un procédé chimique par lequel la pulpe de bois ou les fibres de coton sont transformées en filets à brin unique. Aussi à Cowansville, dans une filature moderne, on crée constamment de nouvelles teintes et perfectionne de nouveaux procédés afin d'assurer au tissu brock la plus haute qualité que puisse leur procurer la science moderne du textile. Avant de quitter le moulin, Le tissu est soumis à main procédé de finissage. Les fils qui courent sur la longueur d'une étoffe constituent la chaîne que l'on monte suivant le genre du tissu à fabriquer. Les fils qui courent d'une lisière à l'autre de l'étoffe constituent la trame. Au cours du cantage, les fils de trame sont enroulés sur les canettes insérées dans la navette. La navette contenant la canette et le fil de trame et projeté d'un bout à l'autre du métier. Une course égale à la largeur de la chaîne s'appelle duite. Et dès qu'une duite est complétée, les lames sont interverties. Les fils du dessus deviennent ceux du dessous et vice versa. Les métiers sont munis d'interrupteurs. Dès qu'un fil de chaîne est rompu, l'un de ces fils de cuivre tombe et un contact électrique immobilise instantanément le métier. À mesure que le tissu est fabriqué, Il s'enroule sur un déchargeoir qui porte une pièce d'environ 120 verges. Les tissus blocs sont livrés de part en ville dans le Canada et le monde entier. Leur marque de commerce est un emblème d'élégance, de distinction et de bon goût. All right, back to you, Suzanne. Okay, so this was a 1948 um, corporate film that was uh, actually uh, probably very uh, innovative in, in 1948 to have a, um, such a, it, it's an, ex, an excerpt from the movie, the film that actually is about 20 minutes, the whole thing. And uh, it does exist in English, although we don't have it right now, but we have, uh, we have, um, um, put together a, just a two minute excerpt, which is what you just watched. Because it's it was actually filmed inside the Brough Mills um, plant in Collinsville. And, and in fact, we have uh, photos of, of some of these, uh, of these takes and uh, some of the um, workers, people that used to work there um, have brought us some, um, some uh, some materials and they have identified in some of them in, in one annual report we found someone who had written the names of the actual employees that were there when they did that film so they were you know they were um they were workers from Cohensville and it was shot in the um, in the in the factory here so it's a precious uh, historical document um where we want to have um in it will be part of the exhibition. As well as some of the um, interviews, we have um, documented um, um, some of the um, uh, workers. We did a, a reunion, I'll talk about it later, but uh, we did a, a workers reunion at some point and to gather, um, uh, collect uh, uh, documents and archives. And uh, some people um, actually were interviewed and about their experience at the mill. Most people that are still alive that work there are now more in their 80s. 
but there are still quite a few of them around. Um, uh, so I will uh, continue. Um, should I should I move to the PowerPoint or? Yeah, go for it. Is that okay? So um, I go to partager l'écran, and there we go. Do you see it? Looks good. Oh, I have to go into this mode. Okay, there's that's better, right? You see it yeah. all? Okay. Perfect. So, um, so this is kind of a, like I say, a teaser or a, a part of the exhibition we're preparing. And some of the text is not, it's it's not properly translated yet, but it's it's kind of a, a, a rough a draft. But you you'll you'll get a good sense of what we're going to talk, the stories we're going to tell. And before I, I go further, I wanted to mention uh, that it's uh, also uh, thanks to Michel Rassico, the president of the uh, Historical Society of Cohensville here, that uh, all this uh, material was uh, gathered and he gave us not only uh, his, uh, his Bible on the history of the area here, but he's uh, he gave us a lot of, um, of uh, documents and uh, stories and he knew a lot of people also. So um you um um it's uh oh yes i'm shuffling the paper sorry <laughs> um so um basically um as you can see on that panoramic picture there with the lovely little brock silk milk truck in the background i find that very touching. This photo was taken in on August 15, 1939, a few months before the war broke. Um, and these people are quite happy, most of them. In, it's an amazing uh, photo. You can see the details. I cannot zoom here, but um, we have um, scanned it so that you can actually recognize people on these pictures. And uh, we have another one in the lobby here and people when they come to Vernissage or, or to just visit the exhibitions, I've, I've seen often people who take their cell phone and they, they go around and, and try to, um, to take some sections of things thinking, trying to find their ancestors basically. So anyway, um, it was, um, and you can, I, I think the text is big enough. You can actually read some of this. So I won't read it all, but it was really, uh, the Brock Mills was really a, a jewel of Canada's textile industry. Um, it, uh, it, it, um, yeah, like I said before, it opened in 1924. And besides this first yard of silk, its other claim to fame was that it, um, uh, it, uh, it did the first Canadian flag uh, in the sense that it produced all the prototypes. It worked in, um, in uh, collaboration with the government to uh, develop the different prototypes that ended up, um, you know, as a, as a um, before the final Canadian flag was, was chosen, there were several rounds of, of uh, we actually have some pictures of some of these, uh, rooms like uh, the, the flag committee room or something. And it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing to see. Um, so um, this will give you a little bit of idea. So this is um, the first, um, the first uh, building um, where there were about 30 workers in 1923. What you see on the right is the first um, photograph we have of the workers that's about uh, that's in 1923 and the building on the left is where they work and on the, on the bottom right is a photo of um, Isaac Brock who was the uh, the founder and he came from New York City uh, he immigrated from Poland and he had uh, he had already worked um, in uh, in New York as in the textile industries he was quite successful but he uh, he was approached by um, the Southern Canada Power Company. Um, was trying to attract manufacturers from uh, from 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 the states, but from 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 anywhere actually. And um, the um, so uh, Isaac Brock came to um, to look at the potential of the place, and uh, obviously felt that it had great potential. And he was an entrepreneur, so he went on and. Uh, started the um, established the uh, headquarters in Montreal as Premier Silk Mills. That was the first, before it was called Brock, it was called Premier Silk 
you say premier 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 silk mills and uh, and uh, and the mill opened in Cowansville in 1922 like we uh, we saw before um, and um, this is a, an ad that um, uh, from the historical societies archive and uh, that came from the Sherbrooke daily record um, an ad for recruitment um, it's kind of interesting that they uh, advertise it also as the most progressive plant in the east east the fastest growing town of the eastern townships um, and then you know they 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 as you can read clean light work on the most healthy conditions I mean that's that's that was the uh, the um, the way they were positioning the company and uh, it worked because why is it not going to the next page oh okay now you you see the next page okay it, it, it was a delay there, but um, you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so why it's it's giving me a it's not wanting to move the the PowerPoint. I would go uh, click escape okay. on your keyboard. Okay. Should I stop the the... Maybe uh, go to see if you can go to escape first, and then. Um... Oh, it's not working. No. Okay, I'll st I'll stop your screen share here. Just start your start your um screen sharing again. Okay. So, oh. Looks good. Looks good now. Okay. Who knows? Sometimes okay. this sometimes it doesn't work. So you're okay. good now. So there you go with the first yard of silk again. So uh, you actually have a, a, a picture of the lobby here, and I purposely uh, set up the stage for the for the not only the yard of silk but the the logo. Um, I think you might see a, a connection here before with our new logo and new logo and uh, and the yard of silk. It's actually the background of the uh, the Brock Mills logo. Uh, Brock Mills, the Brock Museum logo. Um, and, and at the bottom right, you recognize this is on your own. It is, is a, a screenshot of your own uh, website, which has uh, the Yard of Silk uh, as one of your 100 objects uh, that's part of your um, virtual collection. So thanks to you, this project uh, came, uh, came about because uh, it was uh, such an interesting story that actually Michelle Hasiko and Heather wrote, um, as far as I know, this for this uh, for your website, and uh, it was the beginning of a, a big project. Um, so um, at in the early twenties, uh, the company grew very fast, and uh, um, at the time, it was also the only manufacturer with the capacity to produce full width fabrics directly from the raw silk imported from Japan. So the other um, factories, there were uh, there were others that did that uh, wove that wove silk, but they were doing uh, laces and ribbons and you know. So they were the first one to produce an actual yard, which is why it's called the first yard. And uh, and um, um, and then you are mentioned here in the text of Christie. And um, the um, other event around that time that kind of put them on the map is they were part of the um, uh, International British Empire Exhibition held at Wembley in England and uh, in 1924. And they actually um, uh, not only had a sort of a kiosk or some visibility there, but also they won some kind of award for, that was given by Queen Victoria. Um, in the so it grew rapidly. If you you can see, this is an aerial view of uh, it's it it's very much like what you saw in the at the beginning of the little movie you just watched. Um, the uh, you can see how the plant grew from one little building that's at the uh, I can't point here, but at the bottom right you can see the water tower, and the building that's on the right of that is the original building. Everything else is is. Um, um, and you know enlargement in, in uh, and uh, 
and you have here on the right the, uh, um, a building permit signed by Leopold Lee, who was the managing director and the right arm of Isaac Brock. They came together from New York. They were actually related. Um, um, and um, and uh, that building permit shows how fast, and you, can, you have a little engraving there that also shows how big plant had become. Um, and I say from uh, economic boom to demographic boom, obviously, uh, with the uh, income of workers, uh, new workers arrive from everywhere in Quebec, but also from, uh, from Eastern Europe, uh, particularly from Poland, where the Brock family was from. So um, there was even a little, uh, a little uh, uh, area here in uh, Cohensville that was called Little Poland. And we actually did interview uh, some people and uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman who's close to 100 years old who uh, was one of our uh, witness uh, that we interviewed. Um, so to meet the housing needs, um, the Brock participated in a, uh, an investment, in a real estate investment company called Cohensville Realties Limited. They were um, together with other, um, other um, enterprises in Cohensville that did that. And uh, some of these houses still exist. It's that picture you see with the uh, bilingual caption there is an excerpt from the, um, the employee's newspaper. And it, it tells you exactly where in Coansville you can see, still see some of these houses are, are still around. Um, you also have a picture of inside the, uh, there were a series of, um, of a very, very interesting, nice pictures from workers that were taken in the, in the in the 40s, I believe in the 30s and 40s, and the, that one that you see as the 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 dye house, it it has a, and um, we don't have names of those people, and I think um, they're not around anymore. But we have some wonderful documentation of that era. This is the next uh, the next slide. Here is of. Um, in the 30s and 40s, of course, I call it generals. There's a lot of turmoil with the uh, strikes and war, and then women not coming to work. So this this slide talks about about uh, all of this, and um, and the silk sector was uh, relatively spared apparently, but the the workers were still given uh, wage reduction, but uh, they weren't as badly um, affected as the cotton industries and other textile industries. Um, one particular anecdote, and I don't have anything to show here, but we have some documentation on uh, even a, re um, a report from a pretty known, um, uh, pretty well-known historian uh, called Communists in Cohensville, but there was an actual uh, uh, delegation of uh, five, uh, Party, Communist Party delegates who came to um, to hand uh, to lend a hand to the strikers uh, and establish picket lines here in Collinsville, and among them was uh, Fred Rose, who will later be uh, the one and only ever um, communist deputy elected to the Canadian Parliament. But that was later. But he was part of this group, and this historian uh, actually um, um, has a. A pretty interesting long paper on it. So this will all be, be part of um, the um, tell me more section of our exhibition. Um, so anyway, uh, another interesting anecdote is that uh, during this um, strike and the lockout, um, apparently the Catholic priest here was very active uh, in uh, trying to convince the uh, the strikers to. Uh, to return to work and he succeeded. Uh, the, uh, the communist delegates didn't have um, um, a long um, and successful stay. Um, you can see um, on the right, uh, well, on the top picture is, is from 1932 and it's taken, um, that building no longer exists obviously, but you can see it again, um, I don't remember how many employees of him that there was at that time, but you can see uh, there's also a lot of women. Um, and on just below that pictures, you have um, a, a, a selling bonds. Is, is, they were selling victory bonds during the war. Uh, and this is a, a, a shot that shows all the, the employees gathered together in some meeting room. Uh, 
um, contributing to the war effort. And at the bottom, you have um, um, uh, a woman uh, working um, in the mill. And if I'm not mistaken, it's actually, um, I don't know if Michelle is, is part of the audience, but I think it's might even be his mother, um, the woman on the bottom right picture. Um, then we get into this other uh, um, surprise that I had because not only did I, did I not know that uh, the Brock Mills as a resident of Kwanzaa, that the Brock Mill was, was active um, in, the, uh, in the 20s, but uh, I didn't know also they had uh, such a impact on the fashion, uh, um, in the fashion world. And uh, they, they were publishing um, this magazine that was actually quite, uh, quite well produced and they had a fashion editor and everything. And it was obviously to, uh, to, to uh, market to their clients who were designers and, and, uh, and manufacturers. And, uh, and uh, um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was produced in Montreal though. So that's why it was, we don't have, a, uh, we have only a few samples of this magazine and we're trying to find out more and hopefully we will, but um, because it was, it was uh, the sales department was not in Coansville, that was in Montreal and they were, yeah. And this magazine was, um, was um, targeted to obviously, um, uh, it was published twice a month and distributed to department store buyers, yeah, and fashion designers. Um, and um, I, I will, there will be a lot more interesting pictures. You can see a few um, in here. It's just to give you a sense of uh, what it is. And then you have uh, here, um, and I say glamour and cinema, it's because of that little movie that they did in 1948, which they promoted uh, again to uh, their clients. And it, uh, um, the, the, the image on the right is, um, is, um, is advertising that film in their, um, in their magazine actually. And on the bigger picture here is a, is a visit uh, from um, the um, Montreal uh, school. <clears throat> it's a, um, Ecole des Métiers in Montreal. So there were, um, there were often people came to visit the mill because it was at the, uh, um, it was a leader in the industry and it had interesting uh, uh, technological um, um, advancements. So it, it, uh, it, it attracted uh, schools and, and different people anyway. And one of the funny things about this picture, when I have, every time I look at it, look at the skirts of the lady, you could take her, you could take, whoops, I went too, too fast. Okay, that's my mouse. Um, and um, yes, um, you can draw a line at the hem of their skirts and it goes all the way to the back. So we're very fashion conscious students. I think. Anyway, so these are just few of the images from the magazine. You can see it was beautifully uh, done. I have, there's more from the interior. And, uh, and then, and that's where the, um, that's where the PowerPoint ends uh, for the moment. And um, so I, um, how am I doing on time here? Okay, so I, I want to, So after um, uh, in the um, in this was this magazine was published more like in the forties and fifties, and uh, one of the things that happened is that the the next sort of chapter in this um, in this exhibition is about Gerald Brock, and uh, uh, as a as the um, succession, it's called Gerald Brock's Succession and a New Era, because uh, what happened is uh, there was big changes in nineteen. Um, 48 because, uh, um, well, first of all, the Brock Silk Mills Company changed the name to Brock Mills. They removed silk because they started doing um, less, less and less silk and, uh, and more uh, synthetic fabrics. And to better reflect this transformation, they called it just Brock Mills, which is what stayed till the end. But on December uh, 31st of that same year, um, Isaac Brock, um, died at the age of 63, um, leading his son Gerald to succeed him as a president. Um, we have um, 
several documents, you know, um, from that era, um, including photos of uh, Gerald Brock um, in his um, um, as a as a aviation uh, officer, um, a photo taken by Yusuf Karsh, no less. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I can't show it to you now. I didn't. Uh, I, I like I said, it's a work in progress. So we have the material, but it's not quite put together at this time. But uh, I hope it will uh, pique your curiosity. Suzanne, do you want me to uh, do you want me to stop your um, screen share, or do you want to keep that up there with that one slide? Oh. Um, well, I actually, what I would like to do is I, I sent you the timeline that I would like to put in the background for now. You know, the, the one that's called the, um, I sent you the, the JPEG, it's, it's, it's like, a, um, yeah, it's a timeline of all the... Uh, well, I'll look for it and then oh. I'll, um, but anyways, I'm going to put you full screen and then I'll, I'll try to find that, then I'll share that in a second. I have it, I have it, look, look. It's easier this way. Look, uh, I, I think I can do it just this way because it's, um, oh, I see. Okay, no, sorry. Um, okay, so um, I don't, uh, yeah, it, it was, oh, oh yeah, it is open here. So I think if I do this, I have it open now. Yeah, so, just make it full screen and yes, you're good. It, it is, uh, yes. It is full screen. Go to, uh, yeah, you got it. Perfect. Do you have it? Yeah. Okay. So you will see some of these pictures I'm talking about, about Gerald Brock and when his aviation, it's at the bottom left of the, uh, of the, this is actually um, a, a picture of a uh, timeline that is in the lobby. It's huge. It's four feet by eight feet. And it sort of gives you an at a glance, um, uh, at a glance view of the, history and uh, it has kind of three sort of chapters and it's called it's in French right now but we'll have it in English as well it's just not produced yet but um, and in French under la broc mills au fil du temps which means you know uh, the broc mills throughout the it, oh, times I'm not good at simultaneous translation uh, anyway it says it's basically about you know factory stories but also life stories and also artist stories because I wanted to include um, the very interesting um, uh, part of the history of the Brock, which is that uh, Gerald Brock and uh, Eugenie Lee, the wife of uh, Mr. Lee that we saw before, um, they um, they um, they founded they co-founded the uh, art center here, and we'll get to that later. But so that's why you have a whole section there about the art center, which is the reason we have an art collection here at the museum today. So and it was. Um, Co-founded by uh, Gerald Brock and also sponsored by the, uh, the 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 company gave the 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 use of the space to the art center, so they can and they operated from 1956 to 1979, so it had a big influence on the uh, on the community here. So um so I'm I'm back into the um, the late 40s and 50. Uh, Gerald Brock really. Uh, became at that area, it became uh, a very uh, respected leader in the industry. And, uh, and also his brother, Robert uh, Brock was involved as well on the board. He was the vice president. And, um, and uh, that I think he became vice president in 1947 uh, from what we have here on our archives. Um, so Gerald Brock, he was born in 1915 in New York City. And he was a graduate of the University of Virginia. He served on, in the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. And uh, by taking the helm of Brock Mills at the age of 36, uh, he brought a new, um, a new impetus of modernization that uh, kept the company on top for quite, um, quite a while. And uh, looms were becoming more and more efficient and new dyeing methods were uh, increasing the production. So uh, anyway, he also uh, became a dis you know he was um, he was known for his leadership in defending the interest of the Canadian textile industry, uh, and he was um, also the president of the Silk and Rayon Institute. He was the president of uh, uh, Primary Textile, uh, the Institute of Primary Textiles, and uh, also the Canadian Textile Institute. So. 
Um, he was known as a very attentive and respected um, patron, um, patron and boss, actually. <laughs> um, people here called it Monsieur Girard, and, uh, and uh, the employee called him, and they, he seemed to have been uh, very, uh, yeah, very respected. And uh, he also was a painter uh, in his spare time and a great lover of art, so it's one of the reasons. And he was also an informed collector, so this is one of the reasons he was involved in the uh, foundation of this, uh, um, of this Coansville Art Center. Um, and um, like I said before, he, which he founded in 1956. Um, he remained in office uh, as the president of the company until 1973 when they sold to a Japanese uh, firm. Um, so Brock was really uh, a leader in the industry. We have uh, people that uh, uh, we interviewed, some of them are no longer with us, so that kind of uh, gave us very nice um, testimonies about uh, that era and uh, all that leadership and, uh, and also the innovation, the technological invention. We have a, a photograph in the exhibition to come of the first computer for a dry, um, for, um, for the uh, tank surprise, it's a, uh, dying, dying, <clears throat> dying operations. Um, and we have this amazing, it looks like a uh, NASA room uh, with a huge, huge computer and a, and a, and a, um, a worker who's, uh, who looks really like someone in 1969, you will see later. Um, so, um, then there's a whole section coming in the exhibition about the Entre Nous uh, newspaper. It was like a, it, they call it the Journal Entre Nous in French. It was the, uh, the very interesting um, newsletter kind of uh, bilingual and it was published um, um, by and for the benefit of the employees. It said that in the masthead and it was incredibly uh, sophisticated. I found, uh, um, that um, not only both languages were, you know, it was very well done, both languages, but the quality of the photography, they had a full-time photographer for, for quite a while. So anyway, it was a monthly uh, bilingual uh, newspaper created in 1944, and it lasted until 1954. And we do have every single issue, um, some uh, different, uh, different workers, um, gave us some, but we also have one person who gave us a, a binder that had every single one of them, which is gold for us. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. We could do an exhibition, I think, just on those 10 years because it is full of, it's not just uh, uh, about, uh, you know, marriages and births, and it has all kinds of personal things about the lives of the employees, but it also had things, news about the company. It mixed uh, every, uh, also even, uh, um, things from uh, from from uh, I'm having terrible with my sim simultaneous translation here. So I I uh, apologize. Um, actuality. Uh, the um, anyway. So we have things even in these um, these these journals like uh, uh, the, when the queen came. Uh, after her coronation, she came with Prince Philip, and uh, we have a big. Uh, they reported on that too. So not just, uh, not just. But the the, the newspaper was quite a, a success, and in fact, employees kept kept them um, preciously for years, and and that's the first thing people. Um, proposed, uh, you know, offered to donate to the museum is that, oh, we have uh, the Entre Nous, we have several issues and things. So we do collect them. Um, so uh, yeah, anniversaries, wedding births and deaths uh, were in there, but also there's some interesting uh, pictures of uh, um, people, for example, uh, in the back, there's, there was a, a gardener's club here. So the people getting married um, kind of gathered and uh, they were um, photographed here just in the uh, in the land uh, in the back of the museum 
with uh, like five marriages all together, you know, that, uh, and then they would do the receptions here at the museum because the museum is actually, uh, and I'll talk about this a little more in details later, but it's, it's um, the only um, building that remains from that era because the actual uh, um, mill and factory was um, demolished uh, at different times, but the last building, uh, that was part of the old uh, uh, Brock Mills was uh, demolished in 2018. And there are still a few of the, of the uh, hangers, I guess. They are used by uh, truck companies for storage now, but that's, uh, that's still in town, but it's not really uh, anything that shows um, that what went on during that time. There's a whole other uh, section about the Brock clubs and the social involvement. Um, the Brock company was, um, was very involved with um, supporting a local, um, um, local like baseball, hockey clubs. Uh, um, so uh, as the city's main employer, uh, it was an integral part of the local news and the lives of the workers. So between the 1940 and 1970, it organized or financed numerous sports and leisure activities, as well as several clubs intended as much for workers as for the citizens of Cohensville. It was not just the workers. So um, the involvement strengthened the feeling of belonging to the local community. That's why we talked about Company Town at some point, because it just... Uh, um, um, was um, perceived that way by uh, by many people, and uh, there was also um, yeah um, a gardeners club, a bridge club. Uh, so the section will be called the Brock clubs, and there, there are quite a few of them. And there was even um, uh, the what the, the the building the museum is in now was called the clubhouse by the the Brock. Um, workers and and uh, managers uh, and that the company staff also had the advantage of using the premises of the uh, of the stately home uh, called Maison Brock in French and they called it the clubhouse in English uh, it served as a recre recreational and social club uh, for the employees but also um, for the uh, for the uh, the board and the uh, uh, the rooms were equipped with loudspeakers and fitted out um, with billiard, a billiard table. And we still have uh, um, on the third floor here, there's still, um, you can see on the wall there, you can still see where the, uh, the cues were. Um, anyway, so they were hosting wedding receptions and the, and the plant's Christmas party. So we have lots of pictures of parties here in the, in the, in the building of the, where, where the museum is now. Um, and uh, from the 40s and the 50s, the, the, uh, they were, the, the, the clubhouse um, and the Le Club de la Broque is also another way that the employees called it here. Uh, it was at the heart of the social activities in, in the town here. And the Christmas parade was also a big deal. The, the company um, took care of not only uh, organizing and funding the Christmas parade, but they, um, um, they provided gifts to the staff and their children. And uh, several people we spoke to, the workers, uh, had quite a few stories and joyful moments to, re to relate uh, about those, uh, those, uh, those gifts. Um, and um, they, um, they were looking forward to the parade. And we have quite a few uh, interesting uh, very, uh, very elaborate. The uh, char um, allegorique. I'm not sure how we translate that. Um, anyway, they all. Something also that was very interesting about the company is that it had a uh, a pretty progressive um, group benefit kind of program, group benefit plan of of that. Uh, that's one thing that um, I'm still inqu inquiring about, but I get the, uh, from all the research we've done and we seem to, um, to come, come up with the, uh, the feeling that, uh, that the, um, the Brock Mill was um, 
and usually, um, well, there was kind of a social consciousness that was not that common in that industry at the time. And I know that uh, with the textile industry, um, it, it was kind of a tough uh, industry for a, a lot of uh, places and a lot of workers and strikes and things and unions and things. Uh, it had some time a bad reputation, but it's it's pretty amazing to find out that all the people we spoke to here and uh, very uh, most people, not just most people, there are very very few um, negative comments about life at the um, life at the mill. It was pretty amazing, and many people told us things like, "Well, we weren't very well paid, but well, first of all, it was comparable to other." Um, factories in the in that industry but but they seem to appreciate the uh, benefits that they have and some of them were that they had access to a, a, a nurse full-time nurse on site they also had a, a a snowmobile that was sent to people when they um um in uh, in uh, what uh, yeah they had um just a second here. I was just kind of uh, looking for information. I'm not finding, but um, uh, Suzanne, I'm just going to interrupt you. I wondered if uh, it would be a, maybe a good point to sort of bring it uh, to a close at this point and uh, okay. open it up to the audience because okay. I know by seeing the names of people that we have some Bruck family members, uh, oh. which would be kind of fun to uh, to uh, pick their brains and and have them come on and. Uh, We'll get everybody to turn their cameras on now. And, I, and Glenn, you might want to just give a, a little quick outline on how people can participate. I'm sorry to, in, to interrupt you, Suzanne. It's just uh, we're getting close to the eight o'clock mark. Okay. And uh, yes. so it'd be great to have some some people ask some questions. I know my head is full of questions for you. It's been uh, okay. it's been a marvelous presentation. So I'll mute myself and turn it over to Glenn just All for right. a second. Thanks so much, uh, Suzanne and Heather. Yeah, I'm here. Um, to tell you about how to ask your question. So if you're on Zoom, um, use the chat box. If you're on a computer, it's along the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, Suzanne, I'm just gonna mute you there. Um, anyhow, yeah, along the bottom of your window, um, you can just type there that you have a question. You don't have to type out your question. You can come on camera. We'll, we'll make a queue of everyone who wants to ask a question. And if you're on Facebook, um, just leave your question in the comment section and I'll do my best to to catch it and relay it to Suzanne over here. So with that, uh, maybe Heather, I'm sure you have a question to start us off. So why don't you come on? <laughs> I do. I do. I wondered, Suzanne, um, did World War II affect the mill in some way? Because I know some factories that produce cloth had to produce uh, clothing or military supplies for the Canadian Army. So I wondered if there was some sort of... Uh, military responsibility yes um, there was actually uh, yes they were involved in apparently uh, um, producing some parachutes and also um, some army um, um, clothing like you know uh, but um, yes and we have uh, we, we we are actually looking into um into that at this time uh, to find out exactly what it was but it, it has been um documented at some point that they were yes they were definitely involved with uh, producing some more um materials oh, thank you i was i was i thought the uh, pictures were lovely too of the the beautiful 1940s dresses and it's a you know when you think of mill you don't think of, of a mill producing something that elegant so it was quite remarkable to see those those images i didn't know that existed from the bruck mill uh, do we have any questions if you're yeah. not fam familiar I, with the chat box you could uh raise your hand old-fashioned style that's okay too maybe the the family from uh, the Bruck family would would be interested in saying a few words as well. That would be great. No pressure. <laughs> if you want to start your video, um, it's on the bottom. It's towards the bottom left. It's beside the little microphone. There's something that says start video. So you can press that. And um, so I do have a question for in the meantime from Pamela Dillon. Uh, Suzanne, she asks, have you ever considered showing the Bruck film Le Tissu de Not Histoire? at the Princess Theatre in Cohensville. 
Um, not yet, but I think we will um, have ambitions about the, a, a more substantial documentary that would include some of those texts. It's, as in its original form, it's a, it's a little bit long and well, it's not long. It's it's still it's twenty something minutes. So yes, it definitely is on our on our radar. And uh, and I know well the uh, the owner of the uh, the princess. So when uh, when time comes, uh, I think at around the time of the launch of the exhibition, I'm sure we'll have uh, that or maybe that and uh, um, other um, document and within a documentary to show there, definitely. Very good. We have a question from uh, Vicky. Vicky, I'm just gonna unmute you. Give me a moment here. You're on. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, Mrs. Morin, uh, uh, just saying in French, uh, très belle présentation, c'était vraiment fascinant. Uh, now back to English. Um, uh, I was um, wondering, um, Considering the importance of the, the Brock um, Mill uh, to the history of Cohensville, um, was there any um, mobilization uh, from the population to save the, the, the company and then later save the, the buildings themselves? Uh, because he told that they were uh, destructed the, uh, in several steps and uh, uh, the, the last building was demolished in 2018. So I was wondering if there was any uh, um, uh, mobilization from the population to save all of them or um, was it in, in, in the indifference? Well, it wasn't this, uh, as far as I know, uh, mobilization from the uh, population. However, uh, after the, uh, the Brock family um, passed on the company to the Japanese, um, uh, uh, it's like a conglomerate. And then they, they, that was sold to a British company called Consultex. And those, at some point, that company became, uh, had difficult times. And I know that the city did help, did provide some help with tax cuts and things like that at some point. That's one thing. And in terms of preserving um, buildings, um, they didn't preserve the, the factory uh, plant itself, but the, the the house that we're in now that the museum is in was uh, preserved because of the city of Cohensville who didn't want to let it uh, go. And when Consultech bought, um, bought the, uh, the company, they didn't want to keep the house and the, the, the city stepped in and, and uh, you know, um, made some kind of a arrangement with the company and they, they got the building and they still uh, to this day um, take very good care of it and it's a, it's a, it's a, something they're very proud of we're all very proud of thank you Suzanne, um, I have my curator's eye on when I looked at the the yard of silk that you have framed at the museum and I was wondering, um, it, I mean, it's very, it looks like it's discolored. Am I, am I looking at it correctly? Are there plans to have it uh, conserved in some way or has it already been as cleaned as it can be? Well, um, that's a very uh, good question. Um, I would love to have it examined by, uh, you know, a specialist and see because it, as far as I know, it's been like that for five years because I've been here five years and it di I didn't see it uh, fade or, discolored anymore but but it's I don't know what it looked like originally um, but the colors are still quite vivid and um, um, but there there are some uh, it, they look a bit like uh, um, well I don't know if it's discoloration but I I'm taking a good note of your question and uh, we'll uh, we'll take it on as a as a project <laughs> thanks <Got> just wondering <laughs> Got a comment from Rod here. Rod, I'm just going to unmute you. You're on. Right, thanks. Uh, sounds like a really great exhibition and that it's a fascinating uh, story. Um, I'm really intrigued. Uh, I, was, I was noticing in the timeline, uh, the reference to, of course, the creation of the, um, of the Canadian flag back in 1964. And I think next to it, I, I mean, it was very small. I couldn't see the details. But it was, a, I guess, one of the other models for the flag it was sort of three prongs. I know that this was a very controversial issue actually at the time, the pr printing of uh, the design of this flag, the, just even having a, a flag, a uh, Canadian flag. And to be the, the, the organization that, that made it, I was wondering, if, is, was there controversy in, within the factory or in the town 
about this. I know some people felt very, very strongly about this. Especially yeah, I don't know if there, there, yeah. yeah, I don't know if there was controversy, but I know there was great secrecy for sure because it was commissioned in great secrecy by, by. Um, now we have a whole chapter on this. I don't have all my uh, my notes here, but uh, there's a whole story to tell about that too and how it was. Uh, it went on for a while and with the prototypes first and then you know and and the <clears throat> you don't see it yet because uh it was not in the powerpoint but there were there's a there's three prototypes that you can see probably on the timeline one of them had the union jack you know on one hand and and then they, there was one of them had three leaves and then they ended up with the uh the uni how do you say unifolie um anyway the one leaf <laughs> Uh, version that we have today yeah. but yeah. yeah it was like and we have a great picture of this kind of flag committee room there's about an the old man and there's about oh i'd say 25 of them probably smoking cigars i don't know but it's very interesting pictures so uh we actually had a, a funny uh, anecdote here we um i contacted a, a, a theater teacher in the massivani school here um, and uh, we had a project with the st students that we gave him some of our materials, some of our archives and stories and testimonies from people. And uh, um, they did some uh, plays and short plays with them. And uh, you should see what they did with this flag section. It was pretty amazing. They, they sort of mimicked the whole uh, secrecy thing. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. We have a great documentation of those, uh, those rehearsals, they, they came here to the museum, we opened our books and our archives to them and they, they, they created their own uh, little uh, scenarios and, uh, and they were, um, they had one um, performance here at the museum and then one at the school. And uh, it was very successful, the kids loved it. They were about, uh, it was um, secondaire deux, so that's about what, 14 years old, something like that. Kids, so it was a great project, kind of uh, related to this. It will be. We have wonderful uh, photographs that will be part of the final exhibition as well from that uh, that that project. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. I see. Um, I just wanted to mention um, Pamela Dillon left some nice comments uh, in the chat box. I think people should read. Um, very insightful. But I see we have David Bruck with his hand up. David, oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you. So uh, just give me a sec. Okay, you should be on now, or asked to unmute. You gotta unmute yourself. It's in the bottom left. Try to good. You're good. Oh my Hi. god. Okay. Well, well, I'm David Brock. I'm uh, one of Gerald's uh, children, um, and uh, I just want to say, Ms. Moran, this has been fascinating, and I want to thank you so much for your presentation. It's been. Um, it's been really uh, great to listen to. So thank I'm you. I'm thrilled. Um, the, uh, I, I, the, the, the stuff about the flag uh, brought up memories because um, I, I do remember when uh, the company was making the prototypes of these various designs that were being experimented with. And it may have been top secret, but at some point, um, I, I'm, it, my Dad, my uncle Bob clearly couldn't keep it a secret anymore because they flew some of these prototypes. And in fact, uh, my cousin Maggie and Nancy, who are who are here, um, they had a flagpole in front of their house, and I have a recollection that they flew, or that their father flew, one of the prototypes, which was a uh, a th uh, a three um, a um, uh, maple leaf on uh, you know uh, three maple leaf um, uh, leaves on a single stem with blue bands on either side. It was an it was the idea of um, from sea to sea. There was a, a one of the designs that got some traction was to have uh, this symbolic um, uh, what mare usque ad marum uh, to have two blue bands. It was about 1964, and there was this huge controversy. You're right, but there it was, you know, in in um, uh, nylon, flying in the breeze. And uh, I'm I'm trying to I have a memory that we might have flown one or two of these prototypes as well. So yeah. it was out there for everybody to look at. It was kind of an oddity since uh, none of these things, of course, had been approved. When they finally settled on the red flag, of course, there was a criticism that a maple 
uh, a maple leaf turns red right before it falls. So maybe it wasn't the greatest decision, but um, anyway, that was the flag. There was, it was a, a lot of excitement uh, in the company and a lot of those people thought it was really fun. Well, I'm very excited that uh, um, actually that you're there tonight. And I was, I've been hoping, in fact, it was going, it was a, a plan of mine to try to reach out to the family. Uh, and uh, I, um, so far, the, uh, all the work has been done in French and I was preparing, and this is part of it actually, um, preparing things in English so I could approach the family. So it all happened uh, by, um, by miracle, by chance, or whatever, today I got a call from Nancy Brock, uh, Robert's daughter, and I believe that's probably why you're here tonight, right? So anyway, she had heard from her sister, I think, who has a friend who's connected to Quan, and this is wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm very, very uh, happy that uh, you're there, and that I hope that we can... Uh, um, stay in touch or, or I have lots of questions for, uh, for you or for your family and uh, we would love to uh, um, fact check a few things for one thing <laughs> and then maybe um, if you um, know of any of those uh, um, anecdotes or also if you have I don't know if you have any photographs or documents or things but we would definitely be interested we still have a year before the final exhibition so we can still add or modify some of what we have so that would be uh, wonderful thank there you you go well, it's the network at work so yes. that's great <laughs> and thank you David well, it's a fun I'd memory. help if I can yeah. um, my cousin Maggie is three years older than me so has probably has better memories uh, of that time, I was I went off to the states to go to college when I was seventeen and never came back. And I'm embarrassed to say that I've lost all my French in the fifty-five years since then, or just about all of it. Um, but um, uh, uh, my my strongest memory of the fifties and sixties was just this uh, from my dad was just this um, desperate struggle against. Uh, the Japanese imports and the, to try to maintain tariffs and and a sense that this was a unwinnable fight. It was just a, a you know this growing sense of um, hopelessness. It was really discouraging to see because there was so much innovation and creativity and uh, and you know desire for modernization and all. But at the same time, there was just no dealing with with the Japanese. Um, challenge of Japanese imports and it just became more and more uh, insurmountable so it was a it was a long hard struggle not that surprising that none of the kids wanted to go into the business because it no. just looked too grim you know and, and it was preceded by a, a pretty big strike in 1973 too that all happened that year I believe mm -hmm. so that was a growing uh, situation but uh, yeah so, yeah, we have a documentation. We have one ad that, that says, uh, and it was in the Gazette, and it says, uh, Brock family uh, passes uh, the, the company anyway to Japanese. And we have a photograph of uh, Gerald and a Japanese, like he's literally handing over <laughs> something. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a sad picture, but anyway, yeah, we have a lot more. I can't wait to show it all. Thank you very much, David. That's uh, that's wonderful. So I'm sure you'll be speaking soon, eh, Suzanne? So um, I see there's a few uh, extra comments. Uh, Eva Gilchrist said, my dad was assistant manager from 64 to 66. Oh. We stayed in the Brook House one Christmas and loved it. And Antoinetta says, my first job in 1975 was at the Brook Mills in the Montreal office. The silk frame was in our offices and it looks just like it did back then. Aha, uh -huh, so that's good to know. <laughs> Loving all the history of Brux Mills. Thanks, Antoinetta. That's good. Um, I think uh, maybe- We've got a Facebook, we've got a Facebook okay. question. It's, it <laughs> happened. Um, I want to thank um, Catherine Main Oster for this one. She, she asked if there was any contact with the cotton mills in New Hampshire as there were lots of um, unmarried Quebec women who worked in New Hampshire. No, and uh, I was hoping, I was told, um, it was in New Hampshire too, I was told about one museum that was in, uh, what's the town that um, Jack Kerouac was in? Um, 
uh, it's pretty famous town, I forget the name now, but there was a big, there was a museum there, a textile museum, and apparently it was fantastic, but it closed um, not that long ago. So, no, I don't know of, um, there was, no, there was no uh, particular contact me, but the, the textile industry was, yeah, was very, uh, all the East Coast states had several mills and the migration of workers went back, uh, lots of Quebec workers indeed went to uh, New Hampshire and uh, I believe, um, well, I don't know about Vermont, but it was definitely New Hampshire. No, we don't have any uh, particular contact with. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's the end of the question, Suzanne. Uh, okay. There's nothing else from Facebook. So I think we'll, we'll bring the evening to a close. And I just want to thank you so much for a really interesting presentation. It's, I mean, the mill is in, in just in not too far from my community, and I only knew a little bit about it. So this has really opened my eyes to uh, what a deep history it has and what a, a proud history too and the people that have connections to it still today it's really quite wonderful so i'm looking forward to seeing that exhibition for sure so thank you very much to uh, all the people that attended tonight it's always lovely when family members of our of our uh, speakers uh, come in as well uh, or have connection to the to the topic so thank you to the bruck family too uh, thank you to Glenn for uh, keeping the tech online. We are always really happy when the tech works for us. That's thank goodness. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, we have one more presentation in our spring, uh, winter spring series. It's hard to believe it's spring when it's so hot today, but we have one more speaker. Um, and, and it's going to be on Thursday, June 3rd at seven o'clock in the evening, right here on Heritage Talks online. It's by Elena Serolaza called Fire and Ice Cream, Unpacking the 1819 Burning of a Montreal Confectionery. Sounds sweet and interesting, doesn't it? So join us here on uh, Heritage Talks online, Thursday, June 3rd at 7. Thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. It was great to see you. And until next time, have a good evening. Bye.